Okay. Hello, everyone. I am uh, sitting here with Charles Wilson, who I'll give a, a, a second to introduce himself in just a moment. But today we're going to talk about the Autonomous Vehicle Cybersecurity Development Lifecycle. It recently went through uh, a couple of different assessments for both R155 and 21434. And we're going to talk about the status of those assessments, the process of going through that assessment, and where the ABCDL is going, um, and how to get started with it. So just an exciting development for the ABCDL. I've been following and tracking this for a long time, and uh, am really excited to see it getting the recognition it deserves. So quick intro for myself. I'm Brandon Berry, the CEO and founder at Block Harbor Cybersecurity. We work with many of the automakers and suppliers around the world helping support them through some of the challenges due to the standard and regulatory landscape. And, uh, and yeah, you know, so I've been in this space of vehicle cybersecurity for a long time and, uh, and I'll hand it over to Charles for a quick introduction from himself. Cool. Thanks, Brendan. So I'm Charles Wilson. I'm senior principal engineer for cybersecurity development lifecycle at Motional. We make autonomous vehicles, uh, in conjunction with, uh, Hyundai and Aptiv, our parents. I've been doing computer-esque stuff for roughly 40 years, and cybersecurity is my primary focus for about 10 now. Um, and yeah, I'm the, the author and uh, caretaker of the AVCDL. Cool, thanks, Charles. All right, so before I dive into the agenda, um, this Com it, it's going to be a conversation between Charles and I. We're really just going to be talking um, as, you know, kind of uh, two people, two practitioners that have been in this for a long time about the state of things. So, um, you know, forgive any slips. We're not going to edit it a whole lot. We're just going to have some fun with this. So for a rough agenda, we're going to talk about a 101 on the ABCDL, what it is, why it exists, and uh, what prompted its existence. We're gonna talk about what the assessment and certification process was like. We're gonna talk about the state of the industry as the auditors appear to be seeing it. Uh, we're gonna talk about how to get started with the ABCDL and we're gonna talk about if you are seeking your own R155 or 21434 assessment, how you should think about going ahead and getting started building those relationships and pursuing that. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with ABCDL 101. So UNR 155, 21434, these are kind of the two primary uh, standards, regulations, drivers in the space in terms of normalizing vehicle cybersecurity across the industry. Uh, they're going into a effect today, pretty much July of 2022. And 2024, we'll kind of see the full implementation of them. These aren't new, um, meaning they've been in the in and around the industry for a long time. Charles, what's the what's the history behind um, 21434? You know, when did we first start hearing about it? Uh, UNR 155. What was kind of the the start of those things? Yeah, I mean, you can you can trace this back a long ways. Um, it, it's not like cybersecurity is a new magical thing and you've got everything from at the aerospace industry, you've got uh, the nuclear industry. A lot of things are dealing with really safety critical cyber physical systems. Within the automotive space, you look at what the SAE was doing and so they had an initiative which later got picked up as a joint activity between ISO and the SAE, which would become 21434. So, I mean, you, you go back to about a decade ago and things start coming together in terms of, you know, trying to form stuff up. And with 21434, it's like about, I'd say four years ago that it, it starts getting serious. Um, and then of course, yeah, we just got that, the ink dried last year on that last August, I believe. Um, and yeah, that's that's what brings us to where we are today. Yeah, yeah. and the precursor to 21434, J3061, really just a guidance document. Uh, I think they called it a guidebook for securing cyber physical systems or something of that effect. That was released in, in 2016. 
Um, so, you know, yeah, about, about, uh, you know, call it six, seven years that we've had some kind of standard or SAE guidance in terms of, Hey guys, industry start thinking about the issue of vehicle cybersecurity. I mean, I bring this up in terms of, uh, this ABC CDL 101 topic, just cause, you know, you're putting forth a, a framework, which we'll get into in a second, but you know, it's been around for a long time, I guess. Would you say that uh, automaker suppliers have had ample time to start building up their processes? And what's the state of that today? Yeah, I mean, if you, you dive back into um, cybersecurity life cycles to, to build software and systems, and you can find Microsoft's work in the early 2000s that, that was trying to develop some kind of system, systematized way to approach it. Um, ever since we've had software, we've had cybersecurity issues and a car is no different. The, the, the big difference in the auto field is you could always use the excuse that, well, nobody can touch the system, therefore it's not a problem. And, you know, that lasts until it doesn't last. Um, the good analog for that is the medical industry, which, which basically designed all of their stuff to that kind of um reasoning and then there was the whole well let's all connect it to in a little network locally and it'll never be connected to the big internet and then eventually got connected to the big internet and all the problems came and we're doing exactly the same thing with automotive where we had uh infotainment systems that were completely self-contained and we you have the ODB2 port and say, well, you have to open the door, you have to connect into the ODB2 port, you have to do all this stuff. And then there's things like OnStar, where now we're doing active telemetry to the vehicle and remote commands. And now we're doing push updates for various things. So, I mean, we're connected to the big eye internet. So it's same problem. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a fair point. You know, the standards and regulations are coming out about at the time that they should be when, when we really need to start taking cybersecurity as uh, seriously into account. And, uh, and more and more, it's becoming the case with how these vehicles are being designed. So without further ado, why don't you tell us what, uh, what the ABCDL is? Sure. So the ABCDL or Autonomous Vehicle Cybersecurity Development Lifecycle um, was created as an answer to the question, how do you take all of these um, standards and regulatory frameworks and make it so that people can use them? Because these are, these are documents you read when you're having trouble sleeping, to be honest. I mean, they're, they're long, they're dry, they're boring and they're hard to get through um, at the end of the day. Um, so much so that you've got other organizations other than ISO writing documents to explain the ISO documents, which is kind of funny. Um, and so as I was looking at the literature, I didn't intend to, to rebuild the cybersecurity life cycle, but that's kind of where it ended up. It was that, well, in, in order to do this right, you have to have all the pieces in place. Um, it's it's not enough to it's not enough to have certification. You have to be secure. And what I was finding is that there were a lot of bits and pieces that weren't spoken about. And so that's what I did. I spoke about them in detail and showed how they all connected, and then pulled all the relevant uh, references. And at the end of the day, you just end up with this complete take on, well, if you want to do a safety critical cyber physical system in its most extreme form, which is an autonomous vehicle, then these are all the things you need to do. These are all the pieces that you need to have rolling. Um, but if you're doing something less rigorous, say you're building that infotainment system, then all the same things apply. It's just you don't have to have the screws tightened down as hard. Yeah, no, and uh, and so it's a you have UNR 155, which specifies a cybersecurity management system. You know, a management system, mm -hmm. the ability to 
I have a system in place to manage cybersecurity. I know it's silly to say out loud, but it's important because there's management system, there's 21434, which is really a, you know, a suite of processes and, and work product generation that, that needs to be followed. And then there's uh, a cybersecurity development life cycle. So what, what is the difference between these things? You know, how does a, a development life cycle apply versus a, a CSMS and 21434? So strangely enough, there are more, there's more than one way to build stuff. And um, when ISO started writing these technical standards about life cycles, uh, they recognized that. And what they did was they said, you have to have these activities. And these activities need to kind of form um, the backbone of everything you do. But we're not going to tell you how you should implement this stuff. We just want you to have these things. Um, we want you to deal with your suppliers. We want you to have management and um, document tracking and all, all this stuff. And every technical standard that's sort of built on top of these things over time has taken this sort of hands-off approach and basically said, we know stuff changes a lot over time, so we're going to give you the stuff that's going to stay relatively stable. And so if you look at software development over the last 20 years, the way that we approach it and the tools that we use change dramatically. But the fundamental activities are still the same. Somebody sits down, they ideate, they gather requirements, they create a design, they implement it, they test it. Uh, in pieces, they test it in whole, they send it out to the world, and at the end of the day, they put it in a trash compactor somewhere. But you know, none of that changes. The thing is that that doesn't make it secure. Just because we have a management system, that's a place to hang the stuff that we do. That's not the stuff that we do. So if you look in something like 21434, or R155 is the regulation that points at 21434, it doesn't say you need to do a tax surface analysis or, or you need to do um, secure design per se. Uh, it doesn't say you have to do fuzz testing. It doesn't even really say that you have to do penetration testing, but we know that you'd be crazy if you didn't do those things. So that that's that's the distinction. And in fact, if you look at the dot in the, in the standards that this stuff is based on, it says, you know, it's expected that when you implement these standards, you put in place a life cycle, something that, that your company does, that you document, and it doesn't matter what it is. It could be waterfall, it could be scrum-based or Kanban-based agile, um, it could be extreme programming, um, it could be 10,000 monkeys in a room with a typewriter or two. But at the end of the day, as long as you can produce it and document it and do all of the management systemy stuff, then we're all good. So, yeah, yeah, no, I like the I like the way you put that. That the standard is a set of activities and the work products that are you know the output, in other words, that are expected throughout those activities. It doesn't tell you how to do those activities, and it doesn't tell you how to maintain the the those activities over time um the life cycle piece of it the regulation just points out that you have to have that type of management system in place they, they point to the standard and um and so lots of different ways to implement it and so the abcdl is that kind of like practical thing that you can leverage to actually realize both what 21434 is stating as activities and corresponding work products and meet the R155 uh, requirements in terms of what they require of a CSMS. So, right. and, um, and, yeah. And so you, the, the intent there is that at the end of the day, it lets an organization gather all their stuff, if you will, because inside of it is, and here's how this meets the requirements of these standards. And should another standard come up that I need to care about, 
it's just a matter of saying, all right, I've gone through the AVCDL and I've gone through the standard and here's how the pieces coordinate. So you don't have to worry about trying to, to keep up with every new thing that's going on. So the idea is that the AVCDL itself will stay relatively stable over time. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, one other thing I want to draw attention to about the AVCDL is that cybersecurity is not developed uh, is not developed or engineered in a silo. Mm -hmm. It's not independent of everything else. And so, you know, we have 21434 which notably looks a lot like 26262. There's things like Aspice and uh product development life cycles and all kinds of different frameworks that uh, these companies engineering vehicle systems have to think about. Mm -hmm. 21434 is com coming in and saying, oh, here's another one. And so almost instantly, everyone is asking, great, you know, another one, how does this fit in to add this other kind of uh, giant puzzle that we already have? So, I mean, can you speak to how the ABCDL thinks about the kind of corresponding and uh, adjacent uh, standards that, that may apply to, to customers? Yeah, so one of the, uh, serving a couple of different things. So the stability issue of the ABCDL, one of the ways that it accomplishes that is it doesn't try to answer anybody else's problems. Uh, and it says, look, I depend on these other standards being adhered to. So anybody who makes anything manufactured in the world that they want to ship, there's this whole ISO 9000 thing. So the core documentation piece, or what we call the QMS, that has to be there. That's just assumed. So I never really talk about that except to say, you know, there's, there's a QMS thing that you should have that's doing document management, it's assumed to be there. Or it's assumed that if you're building hardware and software that you're following those two ISO standards. And if I can put that off to the side, and, and, and by the way, uh, UNR-156 actually calls out for the first time the requirements management system and which is never and I, I went back and it looks like does anybody else call for requirements management system by name and turns out that this looks like it's the first time that that's the case we all knew that you need kind of a requirements management system but nobody ever said it in a document and so i i presume they're all there i also say it's like i know i need stuff from other people and this is something i always had a problem with trying to uh do cybersecurity in a larger context with, with the development team is that, excuse me, there we go. Um, gotta love Zoom. Uh, the, uh, the, <laughs> the thing with development teams is that, you know, they're trying to do planning. And I say, well, you know, I wanna come in and do threat modeling. And they say, threat modeling, you know, who, who needs to be there? You know, what are the outputs, how many, and it's like, you know, I wish that somebody could tell me what all of my dependencies are. And that's one of the things that every single activity within the ABCDL, it says, it's like, look, here are all my dependencies for this activity. Here's all the outputs you're gonna get from me for this activity. And here are all the things I need from other groups and the people I need to participate from the other groups. So. I can show this to a project manager and they'll go, ooh, okay, I, I need this, this is a dependency, and they'll go to town on stuff like that. And that's really important to recognize and that that's kind of that, that interplay, this doesn't just happen by itself. And that's really important if you think about the, the idea of if you have 3% of staff is cybersecurity, you're doing really, really well. Now, I don't know a lot of companies that can do 3% of staff to work with development, just dedicated to cybersecurity. 
so to your points, like you just dropped another standard that I have to do on me and a regulation set that I have to do. I don't have people who are trained. I mean, there, there's kind of the, the little the little gotcha in there of you have to have people who are qualified and trained. And the industry these days is saying it's like, we don't know where to find people. Um, and so, you know, how do you do this? Well, you either use your own people or you do it outside of house. And I think that that's one of the, the really strong points of the AVCDL is that it's got pieces that are focused on supply chain so that you can go to a supplier and say, I need this and I need you to be doing the cybersecurity stuff. And by the way, you need to be thinking about these things. Well, you can turn that around and say, hey, I'm building this thing. I need to be thinking about these things. I don't have this expertise, but I know I need this now. And so I can go to a vendor who focuses on cybersecurity and helps other companies. If only there were such an organization like that out there, Brandon, uh, they would be so helpful to the industry. But you can take the document and, and show it to them and say, look, this is what I need. I'm not quite sure how that would be done, but you guys do this. Can you help me do this? So I think that that's a really strong element element of utility in it. Uh, and again, that that's sort of the, the play of, well, it doesn't matter how big your organization is. What matters is that, that you're doing the work. So. One of the other practical challenges that I see often in implementing something like 20 on 434 is that it it struggles to get buy-in from the organization. And so it's not just that the ABCDL has these, you know, interdependencies within itself, but also these external standards. It also allows organizations and outlet to follow those standards. And I think that's really important. And what I mean by that is, you know, it by pointing to things like functional safety and other standards, it equips users of, of the ABCDL to really consider how they could follow up the same path that functional safety followed, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just taking into account, you know, I know you and I kind of see this this part of 20 and 434 a little bit differently, but in principle, HARA versus HARA. Mm -hmm. um, you know, HARA is already done, a hazard analysis and, and risk assessment in functional safety. There are already processes and corresponding gates to do that effectively within the development process. So in, in, in the point that you were mentioning, you know, it's difficult to walk up to the development team and say, oh yeah, we just have to do this additional thing called Tara. You know, they're gonna say, whoa, 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 what? You know, we have our own deadlines to meet. Okay. Um, it allows you to kind of follow on under some of the existing processes and stages under parallel standards. Um, and that is tremendously helpful. Yeah. You know, that's almost one of the first questions we get a lot is like, where do you even start with implementing a process like this? And I love that about the ABCDL, that it gives you that practical starting point and the relationship mapping that you need to do to other other standards. Mm -hmm. And and kind of there's a when when you look at the ABCDL, I mean you're you're looking at roughly a thousand pages of material, a hundred documents. It's big, it's it's just big. And you look at it and say, my God, it's overwhelming. And so I, I step back and I said, if I, if I really want to implement this and I'm starting from nothing, what would I do? And so I, I did that, the, the extra little step of saying, all right, well, here's how you can implement it in phases and what'll get you the most traction. And I think that whenever you're doing something, especially if it's cybersecurity being the new kid on the block, relatively speaking, it helps to have wins. <laughs> and you you start with the tactical things and you move into the more strategic things. And that's that's just going to happen. I think that a lot of people are going to be 
shocked that they're not going to get certification the first time around because they can't put all the stuff in place in short order. And it's like, well, hell no. <laughs> we, did, we didn't get safety put in place in, in a year and a half either. So no one should really be surprised. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely, let's, let's do the things that will make the system more secure. And then we add on all of the other pieces because it's a whole lot easier to do that than to try to say, all right, we're going to build this gigantic um, cybersecurity management system and try to backfill in the in the pieces. It's like, yeah, that won't work because by the time you get the management system in in place, you will have a mutiny on your hands. Whereas if you you do things like, all right, we're going to turn on all of the compiler warnings for security, and we're going to use static analysis, and we're going to do fuzz testing and attack surface analysis. We can do all those off to the side in parallel. And you're going to get all the advantages of that and minimal pain. And that in and of itself makes the product more secure. And guess what? A secure product is more stable, strangely enough. So. Yeah, no, I, again, speaking to the practicality of it, it, it makes a lot of sense. So moving on into, you know, a little bit of a transition question to get into the assessment and certification. What's what's the state of the ABCDL? Where, you know, when did you start it? Where is it now? What milestones have you reached? Yeah. What's going on? Yeah, so I started seriously working on the ABCDL in January 2020. And this was not uh, a, a disadvantageous thing. Uh, that that COVID came up because it, it made me have to work from home, uh, in which case I get more work done. But, um, and my coffee's better. The, uh, so we started working with Tube Sood, uh, who Motional had been talking to, and um, on other things, but in, in March of 2020. So started doing discussions saying, it's like, this is where we want to go with it. And let me do a dialogue with you and show you what I'm thinking about and show you the shape of these things. Now, literally, I had nothing in January of 2020. And then over the course of 19 months, I built up enough material that we could do an assessment against 21434. So that's November of 2021. Um, and they started an assessment and then eight months later or so, we had gotten the assessment from, uh, from Tube uh, that we were compliant, that the AVCDL was compliant with 21434 for all those things that were specifically cybersecurity. So again, not responsible for the QMS system or project management or any of the other things uh, in there, just the specific stuff that is cybersecurity. Um, and it's like, yep, yep, we're good with that. Now that eight months is an interesting thing because that is three separate assessments because they'd never done one before that was of this nature. Uh, and so they did two internal assessments and then they did an external assessment of people not in the same group to cross check. Um, and that's why it took eight months. And basically 15 iterations where we would go back and forth, they would look at things. I mean, this, this is looking at all of 21434, um, clause by clause, requirement by requirement, looking at all the material that I had and then they would ask questions. I would add additional material. I would um, actually create new documents. A lot of the elaboration documents comes out of this. I didn't. I didn't start with this huge amount. I think like twenty some odd of them elaboration documents that just kind of go into uh, various bits and pieces of things. It's like, and this is how VNV works. 
um, in, in an ABCDL context, or this is how a Tara works, uh, because I don't, I don't use Tara, I decompose it, because I reuse pieces of it um, for other things that aren't threat modeling. That way I have uniformity across all my processes. That means I can automate it. So yeah, that, that, that took a good chunk of time. It was interesting because it, it asked a lot of hard questions about 21.434. And um, you'll, you'll see that in the, the document that I created specifically for that, where it just lays it all out. It's like, here's what it is, here's the rationale, here's that stuff. Anyway, we did that. At the same time we were doing that, we were kind of looking at 26262 and saying, it's like, what are the cybersecurity elements of 26262? There are two of them at the end of the day. Um, we looked at them, we talked about them, we determined that there's not much that can be said. Um, basically, 26262 says that you have to have this, you have to have communication between safety and a whole bunch of other groups, including cybersecurity. And then it has an annex which says that there are these couple of things that are probably related to cybersecurity. But strangely enough, 26262 is really quiet about cybersecurity. And that's a good thing because it becomes very difficult when you have two international standards and you have to set up, you have to stand up all of the international experts to talk about these things and go through that entire process. Um, and they're on different cadences. So it's better if you can keep stuff fairly separate. That being said, there's an ISO committee that is out there trying to harmonize 26262 and 21434 because there's some there's language difference between the two that kind of uh, adds an element of confusion. Oh, and for, for uh, full disclosure, I sit on the, the 21434 committee and uh, the SAE committees that make uh, commentary, is that the right word? Uh, provide feedback, we'll, we'll say provide feedback. Provide feedback to uh, UN for R155, R156, and also to NHTSA, so. Um, yeah, full disclosure. But uh, so after that, it waited a little bit of time. January this year, we started and we did an R155 assessment because it took me a little bit of time to put that together. That one's actually harder. Strangely enough, that, that was a harder document to write than the 21434 one. And then we went another six months, another roughly 15 rounds back and forth. And we were assessed as compliant with R155. In the, in the areas of cybersecurity. Uh, because R155 has, has some extra stuff that deal with, as you might imagine, OEMs, their reporting, their gaining of type certification specifically, uh, management of those documents, tracking of particulars, stuff which is not applicable to not the OEM. And that, that's kind of a, an interesting aspect of it because the the ABCDL can be applied anywhere in the supply chain. So you could be supplying, say, a smart headlamp, and you could do the use the ABCDL on it. Or you could be building the whole vehicle, and you could be the OEM and still use the ABCDL on it. And that ability to, to fit anywhere in the supply chain is, is a really helpful thing. Whereas 155 is focused on um, the fact that the OEM at the end of the day gathers all the documents of all the supply chain and presents it to a certification body and says, look here, please certify this type. So there, there's a bit of a disparity between the technical standard and the regulatory standard. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's a really big document, that one. Um, and it gets into, it, it'll, uh, when we get to weaknesses of the of the standards uh, or regulation, I'll, I'll talk about that because it does an interesting thing there. So, yeah, no. So you know, to summarize your story, 
Motional really supported the development of this open source thing, the ABCBL. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you went back and forth with TubeSuit for quite a long time on it. Um, you got at first 21434 certified, where ABCDL and 21434 applies to the entire supply chain, pretty much. And then you said, well, what if we wanted to apply this to an automaker? How could they get a UNR 155 CSMS certification behind it? And then so you got to sued to assess it for UNR 155 too. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so you've successfully gotten those certifications. It's out there and accessible for anyone to see. And, uh, you know, it's all op open source, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that's super cool. And uh, practically implemented, you know, Block Harbor has successfully implemented the ABCDL within a number of different organizations. You know, Motional, I'm sure, is, uh, is going through its its process of implementing it. Um, you know, it's it's kind of in its early stages of adoption, much like the rest of the industry is in building their processes. So very impressive what you where you've been able to take it up until now. Yeah, I mean, we couldn't have done it. Um, it, it would not be where it is today without the... Um, the fact that the that the company has allowed it to be made um, available to the wider industry, the the fact that it's Creative Commons licensed, uh, the fact that all the material is there in source and distribution, and now I'm making videos, yay! Um, but it really helps that I can go to a supplier and say, "Hey, look, you're making a widget." I need you to be doing these things because this is, it's difficult for traditional manufacturers to adopt new things for cybersecurity. For suppliers who are making these bespoke components, it's near impossible because all of their resources are dedicated toward the functional aspects of these devices. So. It's a really heavy lift for them. Yeah. So let's dive into the assessment and certification process, just because there's a lot to be learned about mm -hmm. that. Meaning, you know, a lot of our customers ask us, hey, you know, like how, where are the auditors at? And, you know, are they gonna, are they experts on this stuff? Because we sure aren't, but we're gonna proceed anyway. Um, you know, lots of questions around that. Mm -hmm. um, so who, are the auditors you know you talked about two sued what are they kind of where what what's their background what are they coming from what types of organizations are they so they're the when it when it comes to doing the the actual certification uh of these when when you have a thing and you want to want to get it blessed um there are a couple of organizations that are out there that have been doing this for a really long time and TubeSued has a reputation of, uh, if you can get something certified by Tuve, uh, it's probably gonna be the hardest and everybody else will be a lot easier. Um, so they've been obviously doing this for a long time. Um, Tuve is that, among other things, the, what's best to describe it? I, I would call them the German NIST. Uh, in that they are very much a um, an organization which looks at standards. Uh, the NIST may set more standards, but you don't see NIST on the back of your keyboard. You see Tube on the back of your keyboard. Um, so they're they're considered fairly well in the industry. Obviously, there are organizations like UL uh, in the United States. Uh, in addition to Tuve having a presence here in the United States. But Tuve has a lot of experience when it comes to multinational uh, certifications. And when you look at something like R155 and R156 and all of the WP29 family of regulations, they're in the vast amount of interesting countries in the world. So uh, you've got all of Europe, most of Southeast Asia, um, chunks of, of Africa and the Middle East. And if you want to sell a vehicle there, you have to have that certification. 
and they just have the experience in that space. So I'm, I'm sure that other certification bodies are just as competent, um, but this just happens to be who we have the relationship with. The Yeah, no, go sorry, ahead. go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say the, um, the, the choice isn't so much of an issue because if you look at things like R155, there are standards set for who can be who can do the certification so that's a that's a different set of things for the determination so as long as they've they've been blessed by whoever blesses the people who bless the stuff that we do then you're probably in decent shape yeah i know actually that's a very good question so uh or a very good point i should say assessment versus certification assessment basically is is someone coming in saying yeah yeah we think you're in full alignment with the standard or regulation which the abcdl has been assessed as compliant for both 21434 and r155 whereas an actual certification comes from a designated technical service uh that is the the unec uh, committee approved as someone who can issue one of these uh, type approvals or CSMS approvals. Um, TubeSuit, notably, you know, Block Harbor also works a lot with TubeSuit. So full disclosure, um, you know, obviously a very well-respected organization. We, uh, you know, it's a privilege to work alongside them. Um, they're on both sides of the fence where they, what kind of qualifies them to do an assessment is that they are a technical service and actively are an extremely well-respected body to do these uh, type approvals. But what qualifies anyone else from doing an assessment? I mean, there is, is, is there any real qualification behind an assessment versus certification? Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the really big distinction and why, why I kind of make a point of calling it out um, on the ABCDL GitHub site, is that and and this this is something that we ran into when doing the assessment because it's not typical um the abcdl is a fully documented framework so the assessment is looking at that and seeing if it's self-consistent first and making sure that it's compliant with the standard of interest. Now, that means that when you do your certification, if you did all the things in the ABCDL and you can bring the documentation that shows that, it's the documentation that shows that that gets you the certification. So the ABCDL just tells you what it is that you need to do. The assessment said that Yes, we agree that if you if you were to bring us all the things that you said that you did in the ABCDL and you brought that all to us, you would be certified. It you you are covering all your bases. Now, that's interesting, and it also points to a different issue, which is when you if if you were to go to TubeSuit and just say, "Hey, we want to be certified under twenty one four thirty four." We've read the specification. Can you give us sort of, can you certify us? And they'll say, yeah, we'll work with you. And they'll look at all your stuff and they may say, oh, by the way, you didn't really understand this piece here. You need to go and do that. And, and by the way, that's a traceable thing. So you need to provide evidence that you applied that like eight months ago and that you used it consistently coming up. And so regardless of whether or not using the ABCDL, when you're working with a certification body, give yourself a lot of lead time. And this, this is why I have a, a timeline uh, in the ABCDL so you can look, it's like, you know, after I gave them all of this stuff, it took six to eight months for them to ass just assess it. And all I'm doing is making sure the framework's right. If what you're trying to do is make sure you have the actual documentation for your actual product, that's a whole different beast. And if you have 
phase gates and you're having to align different groups and they have to sign off on stuff, that's a lot of work that you may have to redo that's going to hit you. And again, the, the ABCDL gives you the leg up on this because it says, look, here are all the gotchas. <laughs> Make sure that, that you're getting all these points. And if you're not doing these points, that you're doing something that's compatible or comparable, I should say. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. I mean, an assessment, make sure that the framework would deliver the work products, as you said, mm -hmm. the, the outcomes that are that are demanded by 21.434 and UNR-155. The actual CSMS audit and the type approval audit are looking at the process, making sure the process is there. Mm -hmm. The knowledge of the, the process is, is there, meaning that it's not just one person in the organization that's doing it all. Um, and that the corresponding work products are there and good. Um, mm -hmm. Meaning, you know, to your point, yeah, it could they could kick back some of the work products, which requires a lot of rework. Um, makes sense. Let's focus in on those auditors a little bit more. I was asking kind of what qualifies them. You have, the UNEC who qualifies the technical services that can do these type approval and CSMS audits, which then kind of sub qualifies them to do assessments mm -hmm. um, like we're talking about for the ABCDL. What about the individuals? You know, I, I found this to be particularly interesting in working with not just who sued, but others like UL and DECRA and SGS all big testing inspection and certification companies the quality i would say of the audit comes down to the knowledge of the individual the there aren't enough people in the vehicle cybersecurity space that are qualified to do the job as it stands mm -hmm. and so we can't really have the expectation that you know there's someone who has a whole lot of knowledge that's going to be doing the the audit um but they may have a whole lot of knowledge about auditing can you speak about the individuals that may be knowledgeable about auditing but not not knowledgeable about cybersecurity and your experience with that so once I, I i have a lot of people at a disadvantage sitting on the various committees because i know what the intent was of the the text and a lot of times you have access to the text and you read it and say, what were they thinking? And in fact, in dealing with TUSU, there, there was a, a point in, uh, in R-155 that we were going back and forth on. And I, and I said, it's like, this does not, I, I disagree with your interpretation and even if your interpretation were correct, it's your interpretation, and I can't guarantee that another uh, certification body would have the same interpretation. And so it's it's important that that we be able to establish what would the what would the common interpretation of this be? Not not what not what is the desired outcome because it would be better. It's like, we don't get to decide good, bad, or better. We just get to decide whether we did it. You know, it, it says that all these things have to be painted bright orange. That's nice. You tell me what color bright orange is, and I'll paint it that color. That, that you want it yellow green because that's better. It's like, that's not what it says. It says, I have to do this. I did this. Um, so that that comes up where, where you know, I was in the room. I know what they wanted uh, when it was written. I know that we can't agree on it necessarily. And this this gets back to the whole idea that that a lot of people don't realize that ISO documents and regulations are consensus documents. They're what people can agree on. They're not necessarily the best practice. They're just the best practice that the group of people who was working on it on the time agreed on. So stuff gets left on the cutting room floor, you might say. Um, and again, that, that's the same thing with, with the AVCDL. The AVCDL asks you to do things that the standards don't because 
the idea of the AVCDL is that it's a cybersecurity life cycle, not a, it, it's not a CSMS per se, but if you do it, you do the CSMS too. So I think that when you look at the individuals, and I agree that we're gonna get, it's bad now, but we're gonna get to a point that's a lot worse in 2024 and beyond when we start getting more heavy usage of more uh, compute in vehicles for ADAS and for ADS, um, you're gonna overwhelm these organizations and they're gonna do what everybody does. They hire people and they will train them as, as best they can. And there are gonna be people who have more experience, people who have less experience. Uh, and you're gonna get kind of an uneven approval system. And you know that's not good, bad, or indifferent. It's just what's gonna happen. So. So I wanna, I wanna use that as a transition point to talk about something you brought up a couple of times now, which is, you know, kind of the independence with the or within the organization, some of the silos, some of the incentive structures for the auditors, because mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I do think it's super interesting. I have no comment one way or another, but I am saying it's interesting that many of the auditing bodies also have corresponding service arms where they have a wall between them. Mm -hmm. They say, Hey, the auditors, may assess the work of the service arms or maybe not but um the you know there's a wall in between them and so what i am saying is that there's oft, often a business interest for the auditors to pass people mm -hmm. an organization like two suit has to maintain the reputation and thus they are known as being the difficult one and maybe you know push back on a lot of things and force you to go through 15 provisions what's your comment on that meaning that you know they want your future assessment business they want your future uh certification business and thus they may give you a good grade now so that they they get that business in the future what's your comment on that kind of business model and the way it's structured and the way it's siloed so the 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 way the assessment works is that we did work with both both sides because the we worked with the service group to do the assessment and then the audit group did the final review uh, to double check their work and they hit on different things sometimes but um, I think you have to look at how different organizations are going to be structuring the way that they do uh, the work. So if you look at it as a, this is gonna be a one-time fixed cost type of arrangement, then yeah, maybe, but I think that what you'll end up with is that you will stay with the organization that um, gets you a meaningful certification because over the long term, um, I mean, c considering that most of these are going to be dealing with automotive manufacturers. And so they're in it for the long haul and it is not advantageous for a certification body to cut corners because then you just lose the contract. You'd be, you'd be like that guy who, whose only job was to keep Burger King happy and buying Pepsi products. That was his account and he lost it in the eighties, which is why you don't see Pepsi products in Burger King. And you have to ask yourself, how did he let that happen? I mean, that, that, that was his thing. I mean, it's not a big deal to, to keep one customer happy. So yeah, I mean, it's I, I think it's I think it's like that. There there is a lot of friction to leaving that type of an organization. It's like your accounting software. I mean, you are going to have your accounting software for five years. It's a large commitment. There's a long lead time to get there. And if you have multiple products that you're going to be getting certified, and you're constantly being 
you're constantly dealing with friction, that's a high disincentive to work with that certification body. But more than that, if you've been burned once by a particular certification body, you're going to be really careful about the next one. So I think to some extent it's it's kind of um, it, it'll reach its own little homeostasis there in, in fairly short yeah. order. I, I agree. You know, what I am pointing out is the difficulty, honestly, for the certifying bodies right now. It, they're in a difficult position. You know, mm -hmm. it's just how do you find people who are knowledgeable enough to issue a certification they could stand behind? It's that thing that you're you're pointing out that, the, hey, their reputation's on the line, mm -hmm. um, you know, future business is on the line in terms of the quality. At the same time, there's a downward cost pressure because turns out, you know, there's 10 certification bodies, there's 10 assessment bodies. I can go to any one of those 10 and the lowest, lowest cost may win. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it is an interesting balance. It is, I hope it finds its homeostasis. In the end, you know, I think, um, I, you know, I think, again, it's a difficult position for the auditors to be in. Just, you know, notable, notable uh, characteristics of, of the industry. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And uh, in your experience with Tube Suit, I mean, you know, I'm sure you were going through it, learning a lot about the standards and regulations just as they were. But in the end, you came to an agreement and said, yeah, you know, we can have a justifiable argument for almost every single thing within both 434 and UNR 155. Yeah. And I think one of the one of the interesting points is that there there's a a mechanism built into all of these standards, which is referred to as tailoring. So it's like, here's the process that we recommend. But you can tailor that as long as you get the same outcomes. Like again, it's it's all about can you get us the, the work products that satisfy the requirements? And uh, in the case of R155, there's a, a fairly infamous Annex 5, which has a series of attacks. Well, the AVCDL is not attack based, it's requirements taxonomy based, which is kind of the opposite. And so I had to show how the AVCDL sufficiently addresses the requirement within R155 using this different mechanism. The same thing is true with the TARA and the way that I, that I handle threat modeling. But to see how the, the assessment group and the, uh, the audit following that was able to be uh, convinced that yes, it was an equivalent mechanism. And so it's, it's, it's not just, well, if you do everything exactly right, then they'll give you a pass. It's the, if you can defend what you're doing, then they'll treat you reasonably. So, but they, they certainly didn't let me, they didn't cut me any slack on it. Um, so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, and, uh, you know, it, it is interesting to note, too, just we, we've seen this kind of developing in different ways in different countries, even the UN participating countries about what whose certifications are accepted. <laughs> the broad consensus is that, hey, if you're a technical service uh, defined as defined by the UN, that, yeah, you know, everyone's certification will be cross accepted. Some governments are saying, no, you have to go through us, the government entity, and, in, you know, totally new player being introduced into the game to receive some of these certifications. And uh, I know we're kind of conflating certification and assessment a little bit here. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, again, just, just pointing out who are the players in the space and, and uh, kind of what's going on at these different organizations and, you know, some of the challenges they have and some of the challenges we may have. Uh, as those being assessed or certified. Well, and you look at the, I mean, we, we talk about UNRs and um, there, there's kind of the, the elephant in the room, which is North America. 
uh, and we'll kind of set that aside because North America is, is its own space. But you can look at China and China has its own regulations, which are by and large, just kind of a, a an exploration of uh, J3061. Um, and then you look at Singapore and Sing Singapore has said, it's like, yes, you need to do all the things in 21434. And it's like, okay, that's nice. Why don't you just sign on to R155? Um, <laughs> and, my, and make life easier. We get one stamp of approval and we're good in Singapore too. Uh, so, but yeah, I mean, countries are gonna do what countries do. Um, well, yeah, and it, it, it's interesting getting back to that point that you mentioned. UNR one fifty five does not prescribe twenty one four thirty four. So even as much as twenty one four thirty four is is uh, you know we're discussing it here as kind of the backbone. It's you could do something totally independent if you so desired, if you could prove that the outcome was the same. Um, but you know, to that end, maybe that's why Singapore said no, 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 no. We're not leaving that open ended. You're using twenty one four thirty four, and and people actually recognize that a lot of to, to some extent that comes from the the fact that that 20434 and r155 are nearly concurrent in their creation i mean it's it's worse with uh 24089 the the software update and r156 the regulation on software update because r156 made it like a year ahead of uh, 24089. And we're now going back and saying, okay, here are the changes that you need to make to R156 because it, it literally has placeholders in it that are like regulation 15X and things like that. It's like, really, you made a law and, and you put placeholders in. Um, so yeah, we're going through and saying it's like, look, you should do 2489. And the same thing is true for R155. It's like you should do the stuff in 2434. Um, because, yeah, I mean, if, if all you say is, well, you have to do stuff, and there's this international standard and nothing else, it's like, well, most companies are going to do the international standard because they only want to do one thing. No, Nobody wants to implement a whole bunch of other stuff. And that, that also, to, to sort of get off on a slight tangent, if you have a supplier and they're supplying more than one manufacturer, they're going to have one development life cycle. Whichever is the most conducive to satisfying the most customers, that'll be the process that they use. Nobody, nobody wants to have two, let alone, you know, a dozen different um, methodologies that they have to apply to build their thing. So hopefully the, the suppliers find that if they do the ABCDL, it's like, this will make everybody happy. You just do this one set of things, however you want to implement it, you know, and you get your bases covered. Yeah, yeah no, a notable difficulty that we notice a lot is that suppliers will have you know they'll be developing one product for three different customers and every customer asks for something a little bit different um you know they even prescribe templates that are asking for things different in nature meaning different interpretations of 21434 at the uh oem layer that yields different requests entirely so mm -hmm. Interesting tangent. Um, let's bring it back to uh, to to the auditing process because that's what we're here to talk about. You know, ABCDL was audited, excuse me, assessed and then audited. Mm -hmm. um, it received uh, uh, you know approval on that basis. Um, what I want to kind of move on to next is you spent a lot of time with TubeSuit. Yes. Um, Companies like TubeSuit, again, Decra, UL, SGS, are going through their first runs of this, if you will. You know, you brought up NXP earlier in our conversation before this call and their early ISO 21434 assessment. 
Um, you know, they're going through their first runs of this. Customers are going through, customers of the assessors are going through their first run of it, meaning they're, they kind of put some stuff together, glued some stuff together, and are running into it with their fingers crossed, hoping that they pass. Mm -hmm. Did you get a sense from Too Suit about what they're seeing across the industry, meaning our, our companies across the board, automakers, suppliers, autonomy companies like Motional, are they coming into this with just real perfect uh, cybersecurity management systems and the corresponding work products? What's the state of that? What are, what are the auditors saying? The, the sense is that the, that the industry is very immature. Um, this, is, this is all new. You have to look at the, the model that we had before this. It's always been, you build stuff, you give it to the, the OEM, and it's the OEM's responsibility. It, it's from, from a cybersecurity practitioner standpoint, it's just shocking that you have this, what's essentially a toss it over the fence uh, thing. And the, the testing and the responsibility all ended up being the OEMs. And very top down, it's like, tell us exactly what you want, we'll build exactly what you want, we'll give you exactly what you want. And as if you're doing that in the absence of cybersecurity, you know, fine, because everything is standardized. And if it's just a matter of manufacturing, it's like, cool, we've been manufacturing forever. But software is so intangible and so, uh, so mutable and so infinitely attackable that you just can't do that. You can't put this, this severely complex system together and, and then kind of hope that a couple of days of penetration testing is going to show you where all the bugs are. And it's like, and even if that were the case, now I know that I have a couple bugs that I was able to find because I applied a certain amount of time and technical capability and experience that I have as the person who's doing penetration testing, because penetration testing is still really bespoke. Um, and you can have a vast amount of difference between two people doing the same type of work. Um, so you, you do this and then it's like, say I find five things, like I don't have a warm fuzzy. It's like you worked up until the very last moment that you that you had time allotted to you and you found five things. What if I gave you three more days? And you have to be more systematic about it. And that that's kind of, again, the focus of the ABCDLs approaching things from, from two different layers, looking at design defects and looking at implementation, um, sorry, looking at design flaws and implementation de defects. Because I find it a, a design flaw and it might cover like 15 things. Whereas an implementation defect, that's one thing. Did you get it wrong once? Did you get it wrong 15 times and just didn't notice the other 14? Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's a big problem. The getting the supply chain to, to be more, uh, more aware to have more skills to, to, to do this stuff and also have the OEMs enforce that because they can't just say, oh, well, they gave us this, they've given it to us in the past, it's going to be the same quality. It's like they didn't check the cybersecurity on this stuff. <laughs> They're expecting you to check it. It's like, oh, well, we thought they would give us the thing perfectly. It's like, no, no, <laughs> that's not what's happening. And so that, that's why you have the CIAs in place now between the organizations. And that's why with the AVCDL, you have both the, the, the self-certified maturity and also uh, the manufacturer disclosure statement so that they, they say up ahead of time, it's like, these are the processes that we do and this is where we think we are. And it's not to be punitive, it's so that you know where they will need assistance and so you can provide it. Um, because what's the point of having a cybersecurity agreement that says, hey, you're gonna threat model, right? And they nod, yeah, we're gonna threat model. And it's some 
buddy's kid who comes in on the weekend and, and you know reads Adam <laughs> Shostak's book. Um, it's like, yeah, no, that that doesn't cut it for us people. <laughs> Yeah, well, and and just for clarity for everyone, CIA meaning Cybersecurity Interface Agreement, often referred to as a, a supplier interface agreement. It's the document that you know says, "Hey, we're going to demand these things from a, a, a cybersecurity standpoint." Yeah, and you know what's super interesting about that is it it brings up this issue of cost. You know, cybersecurity is expensive, and so you know when the automaker goes to the supplier and says, "Hey, suddenly." You know, the automaker is being demanded to do cybersecurity. They already have a five or 10 year agreement in with this existing supplier. And they're saying, hey, now I need you to do cybersecurity, too. Um, right now, it's like for those existing agreements, it's like, hey, you know, we have to do it. So you have to do it. Sorry. You know, it, it, the future of your business is at stake um, for the new agreements. Everyone can uh, appropriately put, price it in where mm -hmm. they can say, oh, yeah, we think we'll require this many hours to do the request you're asking um, or to align with 21434, whatever it is. Um, uh, a notably difficult challenge is the money. You know, so a lot of suppliers were in a boat where they, you know, they ignored the problem for a long time. And then they said, oh, well, here come the asks. And oh, man, who's paying for it? And uh oh, um, you know, Jimmy from Functional Safety, you're taking over cybersecurity now. Um, you know, that's just how, how it's going. And so, you know, to summarize your point, it's you have, or really the point of that we've been making throughout the discussion, you have the graders of the exam, the auditors, they are still gaining maturity and understanding. You have them saying, well, you know, we, we may not know a whole lot, but our uh, people we're auditing also don't know a whole lot. You have the automaker who's receiving the assessments and type approvals and audits. Um, who they, they're still figuring it out. And then you have them who are essentially the exam graders of their suppliers, um, you know, who need to ensure that their suppliers are keeping everything in check. Um, so like everything, it'll come to a homeostasis where suppliers will do cybersecurity because all their customers are asking for it. They'll just do a good job because they have to based on their many customers asked. The automakers will figure it out because that's, you know, they figure... They have to figure out these types of uh, challenges uh, decade after decade and reinvent themselves. And, oh, by the way, they're going to be graded and the exam graders are getting really good at grading exams eventually. Um, I think it'll reach a homeostasis. What's your thought on it? Yeah, I, I, I think that there, there are a couple of things that are forcing functions. One is that um, the, the regulation has teeth in that types can be revoked. So if they if if an audit is done and because you have to be periodically providing information to the local regulatory agency that's overseeing this stuff. And if you don't or if you lie, then the certification for the type can be revoked. And it's like, yeah, it's right there. Um, part of this is also kind of enforced in an indirect way. And that is that you have to provide software update for, it's right now it's an indeterminate amount of time. Um, sense of the UN is they'd like it for the lifetime of the vehicle. No one's gonna do that. <laughs> it will be, probably be something unreasonable like 15 years. Think about what that means for the supply chain. I mean, that's a long time to have to maintain the software, the build environments, all of this stuff in order to be able to handle a cybersecurity. And the, 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 the reason for it is not just to be able to do a software update. You have to be able to do a cybersecurity relevant software update for that period of time. Um, none of this, oh, you know, please turn your turn in your router and and load load the new software it's like no 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 you have to provide a mechanism you're going to have to take the thing to a dealership probably and they're going to have to be able to update that that software well that means the supplier has to be able to be producing this stuff uh for for the vast majority of it that's a big ask that's really expensive um 
even uh, teams ask, it's like, well, what does cybersecurity cost? And the best figures that I've been able to, to figure out and put together is 5%. And it's give me 5% of your processor, 5% of the time that's going to be taken, 5% of the development staff, 5%. Just give me 5% of all resources that you think you're going to need, and that's what cybersecurity will take you or cost you. Uh, in, it's roughly the same, doesn't matter if it's impact of doing encrypted versus unencrypted data. So I get 5% bigger. Um, I take, I get 5% slower um, for all that stuff. But that becomes, that's profit margin, right? <laughs> so everything is going to get more expensive. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it, it, it's enormous. Not just doing it the first time, but maintaining it is, uh, yeah. you know, is the point you're getting at. You know, I'll, I'll cover one last point on this uh, to maybe bring it back to the beginning of the conversation about maybe the state of the industry as the auditors see it. One thing that I find was really interesting is that working with different customers, it's not only that they interpret the standards slightly differently mm -hmm. it's that many organizations who did have pre-existing efforts before the standard meaning maybe they based on j3061 maybe they based it on the smart security person that they hired from the cloud world maybe they based it on you know whatever else whatever book some executive read about security um a lot of organizations entered into 21434 with security baggage, meaning doing things just differently than the way 21434 uh, asked for it, and then trying to figure out how to back that up into 21434. Right. Um, you know, and I, I, I think that's a, a interesting thing. So, I mean, any sense from the auditors about how they're seeing the inconsistencies between different customers. I know you're not the auditor, but again, just having spent time with them and also having spent time with members at the 20 on 434 committee, you know, what's your sense of that? Well, a major, a major automotive manufacturer went on the record uh, for saying, you know, they said in public forum. So the, in public forum that that you could only do cybersecurity using waterfall. Now, that that's a that's a bold statement, and there are many people who agree and many people who disagree with that statement. But it speaks to that uh, because obviously, a lot of people in the safety realm live and die on the V model. Now, the V model, in my opinion, is just as linear as waterfall. It's just kind of bent up at the ends. So they dropped it. Um, uh, there's there's no difference there. But if you have other things, I think that what what the auditors and the the, the certification bodies in general come back to is the work products. And this is this is something that is really focused on in the in the standards themselves. Is that there are always work products, and work products have requirements. And you got to do those. Now, there are recommendations, there are best practices, there are annexes, which are all informative uh, materials. And those are people having opinions about stuff. And that's nice. But at the end of the day, to be compliant with the standard, you have to do the you have to fulfill the requirements of the work products and it doesn't matter how you do it um hamsters with flags uh so it, it's it's all good so if 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 you can if you have a process if you can justify that process you're good if you have a process that is not justifiable no bueno uh, and that's really what it comes down to. Um, yeah. A bad process is not going to get you certification. No process is not going to get you certification. A poorly implemented good process probably will get you certification. And the reason 
for the last one is that there's this stipulation of continuous improvement. And that's why the ABCDL does the, the maturity aspect of it. Uh, because you want to know where you are. You want to know that you're getting better. So metrics. <laughs> and, and to be able to show them, it's like, look, we don't have the world's best process right now. And here are the metrics that we're doing. And we've got processes that are documented, but they're not fully in place. The auditor will look more kindly on you than you going in and saying, bless us because we use Agile. And yeah, that just won't fly. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. I mean, it's, uh, it's, and actually the one I'm worried about is where you have a good process, uh, a defensible process, I'll say. You have defensible work products but the outcome still is not good. Um, meaning, you know, you could do threat modeling a hundred different ways. Um, and that'll, you'll have a whole process behind how you handle all different risks that are, you know, resulting from that. You know, all that could be great, but if you didn't do threat modeling good in the first place, and even though it could have been defensible how you did do it, there's uh, stuff that could be missed. Um, nonetheless, that's, it's just a concern having watched different companies go into this with different baggages, different ways of viewing threat modeling, different ways of identifying risks in the first place, different ways of thinking about cybersecurity goals and requirements, which you and I have had long discussions about, where in the end, you know, it, it again, everything may be very defensible, but is it yielding a secure vehicle is a totally different question that the, the auditors, the assessors cannot determine easily. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. You know, only only the industry can, you know, the, the hackers will will determine that. Well, and you've, so, seen, you've seen this because uh -huh. um, how many threat models have you seen that end up lovely coffee table books? And that's where they start and end. If you can you can do attack surface analysis, you can do penetration testing, all of the other things that we do in cybersecurity. But at the end of the day, if those issues never make it into the issue tracking system, they're never given view by the group that's responsible for doing risk and they never get uh, triaged and assigned and mitigated. Yeah, you, you had a nice process for generating that information, but you had no process, or you, you, you didn't use your process for ingestion into your development environment. And then you didn't do the, you didn't do the V and V aspect of, you know, check the threat model again to make sure that you actually fix the things. So, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a perfect example of, yeah, look at all of our process. It's like, yeah, you, you did you did the things, but you didn't do anything with the things. So yeah, yeah, a lot lots of cracks to slip through here in in what it would end up being a very long and complex process with many stakeholders involved. Mm -hmm. Not just teams within the OEM, but teams outside the OEM entirely, you know, the suppliers who all have different motives. You know, suppliers are trying to save as much money as possible because they're being nickeled and dimed to death. And, you know, the automakers are, are trying to keep the car as cheap as possible. So they're trying to defund everything as much as possible. It's a difficult business with a lot of players involved. And uh, in, in the end, like I said, a lot of cracks where cybersecurity can lapse as, uh, as a result, even with a good process and good work product. Mm -hmm. So, okay, um, you know, what a fascinating conversation. I mean, really just commenting on the state of things, on the state of auditing, on what that process is like, on the state of the industry from the auditor standpoint, um, and the ABCDL and kind of how it, uh, how it was able to kind of push through this, come out the other end um, with a thumbs up, you know, we at Block Harbor have customers with a thumbs up. I strongly believe in its ability 
to both be, you know, and I'm not calling this, the, it's, it's a life cycle, but in, both have good process, um, good work products and a good result, mm-hmm. which is the, that final important question. Um, and it's free, it's free and open source, which I think is one of the most impactful uh, statements in, in the industry because anyone else treats cybersecurity as IP, um, uh, you know, cybersecurity processes as IP. Um, but this is something that I cannot understate the impact where you're giving resources to all of those suppliers who are out there who are, you know, call, looking over at Jimmy um, from functional safety. And Jimmy's going to be saying, you know, the first he's going to read uh, 21434. Um, you know, he might read UNR 155 if he's at an automaker. And he's going to look at those things and say, now what? You know, um, and and the ABCDL is an outlet for those individuals. All that being said, um, I'm very impressed with the ABCDL. Obviously, the assessors were very impressed with the ABCDL. How can someone get started with the ABCDL? Meaning, where do they go? Um, what kinds of things are you working on to educate them? What's up with it? So, a couple things. Uh, there is a dedicated GitHub site. You just go into GitHub. Actually, you probably just go to Google and type AVCDL at this point in time. Um, most of the references to GitHub are that, but there is a GitHub site. So if you go into GitHub and you say search, type AVCDL there, uh, go into Google, type AVCDL. There are also some videos that we are in the process of creating. It takes me a while to make a video, so. Uh, I only have to make 70 of them, um, but they, <laughs> I've got the overview and the supply chain ones are there, kind of the, the first most important ones to look at for a lot of people. The within, um, so you can go there, download the whole thing, all the sources there for, for all of it. There's a distribution area, so it's all in PDFs, or if you want, any of the diagrams to, to make animal pictures, to show to management, to say, hey, we should do this. All the graphics are there um, to be able to work with. Uh, for the videos, all the keyframes are there. The entire scripts are there. So if somebody decides that they want to translate it into some other language uh, because someone else in the world wants to use it, that's cool. Um, but they can provide feedback. The One of the big things that is going to make this all workable is automation. And so there's a lot of work to be done in the future about how do you automate the things that come out of these steps. And there's some there's some material in there that points to how um, I would suggest it being done by extending, extending an interchange format called Serif. Um, and I'm working with the Serif committee to make it broader so that it'll work for all the different things. So your DevOps folk will be able to have just one file that you get out of all of the different activities. And they'll be able to suck it in, pull it apart, and put it in your issue tracking system so that we don't end up with coffee table books anymore. And whether it's threat modeling or tax surface analysis or penetration testing. Penetration testing was the hardest one to get a standard format for. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's all there. The videos are there. And um, so... My email address is, is there. So if you want to send me comments or ask me questions, that's a perfectly uh, reasonable thing to do. I'm stressing out and I'll, I'll get back to the topic, a short aside, but just because we're working on something very similar, Charles, and I don't think we've talked about this, but called Open Exam. And so we, you and I should have an offline conversation about Sarah first Open Exam because um, I'm sure we can go on about that. Um, but yeah, you know, interchange between different phases, I think is really important. So go to GitHub, go to Google, go to whatever other search engine may be available to you if you're in another part of the country, uh, world um, and search ABCDL. If you don't find it there, there will be a link somewhere. Um, there's trainings. There's It's a Git repository with many layers that you should explore and immerse yourself in the many, many documents that are involved. It's complicated. It's complicated because it because cybersecurity is complicated. Um, 
And, uh, and you know, this is a, a very complicated problem. Immerse yourself in it. Don't be afraid of it. Use the videos to help you kind of digest it. Um, all right. And then, so you went through an, an a 20 on 434 assessment, a UNR 155 assessment, which is, you know, pretty close to a CSMS uh, audit and sort of corresponding certification. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's say I'm an automaker out there. I'm a lead engineer, an automaker. I'm a supplier, um, and I'm thinking about approaching, you know, an, an auditor. I'm looking at a deadline on my calendar that, hey, by this date in 2024, um, I'm going to have to go through an audit, and I, uh, I don't want to think about it because I'm just trying to get the the basics up. How do you start thinking about assessments and audits? Um, early on? What's your advice to organizations or individuals that are maybe starting to think about it, are stressing it, and uh, and don't know what to expect? So a couple of different things. Specifically for R155 and 21434, what I suggest is that they grab the document, the fulfillment documents for those things that I wrote, because that has all of the, it strips out all of the the ISO speak and it just says like here's the thing you have to have and so you get this nice compact list if you will or this, this compact document that that just hits the points one after another saying this 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 and these are the things that I did now doesn't mean that you have to do all those things but it shows you all the points in a in a way that is that strips out all of the wonkiness that is either the ISO document or the UN regulation. The next thing is um, talk to the certification body assessor and ask them what their expectations are. Um, how do they want to work? In the, the case when I was doing my assessment, it's the, you know, we want to have this long, uh, discussion period before we start the assessment, where we kind of put documents in front of you and say, this is what I'm thinking. Is this decent? Now, this is consulting, obviously, but it's consulting that that's well worth the money because you don't go through all the trouble of, of assembling a whole bunch of stuff, giving it to them, and they saying, no, you don't get it. <laughs> that's not what we're looking for. So having that that pre-dialogue is important even before the assessment to, to get have them give you their sense of are you is your head even in the right space for this and depending on your background um it may not be and they'll be able to, to give you hints the other thing is uh cybersecurity is not the only thing that needs certification or assessment and so if you have someone who's responsible for compliance within your company, be talking with them because they should be talking with you. But if they're not yet, because they don't know that there's this new standard, uh, then be talking with them because they've done this kind of thing before. They've worked with certification bodies uh, and they know kind of what to expect. That's their job. So you're going cert the certifications for cybersecurity have to fit in the context of all the other ones because they're not it, it doesn't just stand alone you don't just kind of like hey look i've got a 21434 certification <gasps> that's nice um you don't have all the rest of them you have 26262 and then you know iso 9000 and yeah and stuff so yeah all that has to to be done has to be harmonized um, they're going to look at it and say, it's like, well, you, you did all of these cybersecurity things. How did you coordinate your work with safety? It's like, as soon as the, as soon as the coordination question comes up, you had better have a good story because it's like, oh no, we just let, we just let this group do this thing. And then this other group did this thing. And then we did our thing. It's like, no, 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 that, that violates traceability <laughs> it's like <laughs> so, yeah, yeah yeah so that that's well, what we'll start. yeah and uh 
And that's that I think that's really good advice to anyone trying to get started with this stuff, especially the refer re reference to the ABCDL document. I can't remember what you're calling it, but that kind of lays out what they're um, what they're looking for without all the craziness. Yep. The fulfillment documents. Um, fulfillment document. The autonomous vehicle cybersecurity development life cycle. If you don't have an autonomous vehicle, it doesn't apply to you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um so as Charles mentioned many times, don't, you know, the, the, the naming I think was chosen early on um, applies to anyone in the supply chain seeking to achieve a cybersecurity development life cycle that meets 21.434 and UNR-155. Um, very exciting, Charles. Um, good work on this. We're really excited to use that block harbor. We're still digging through the details, honestly, of how, um, you know, complex it is. But at, at each and every turn, we find that it's the right way. Um, so I appreciate your time today. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure chatting with you and kind of picking your brain on some of these complex subjects and, uh, congratulations again on getting both the 21434 and UNR 155 assessment completed and the thumbs up from, uh, one of the toughest auditors in the space. Thank you. Thank you. And it's always, always good to talk with you and, uh, I appreciate Block Harbor's support on all of this. So, yep. Sounds good. Thanks, Charles.